Welcome everyone to the Accra SDG Investment Fair. And this is a panel on business opportunities for MSMEs in the pandemic era. We'll be talking about business continuity and building resilience in the era of the pandemic. My name is Amalate and I'm the CEO of Impact Investing Ghana. I'll be your moderator for the panel. And we have a really, really um, knowledgeable panel. We have Mr. Kwesi Ajeman, CEO of the Ghana Tourism Agency. We have Kosi Yanki Aye, who, who is the um, CEO of the Ghana Enterprises Agency. We have Ajo Dede Asari, who's CEO of Alfie Designs, and Matthew Bwedweje, CEO of Oasis Capital Ghana Limited. So entrepreneurs, capital engaging conversation. So I'm going to start the panel by providing a little bit of context, and then I'll ask our panelists to introduce each other, to introduce themselves, and then we'll jump right into the panel. We are just recovering, the whole world is recovering from a major pandemic that has made many businesses suffer a lot of major setbacks. Some businesses have closed, and some have had significant and changes to their business operating models to survive. There have been a lot of support programs rolled out across the world to help businesses survive, including in Ghana, some run by our Ghana Enterprises Agency, interventions by banks and other financial institutions. And some businesses have thrived, but many have struggled. Today, we're going to be talking about business continuity and how small and medium businesses can build their ability to ensure that the operations are not severely impacted by a disaster and that they are able to seize the opportunities that come in these times of crisis and of change. Um, we have um, this eminent panel and without wasting any more time, I'm going to ask them, maybe starting with Akwesi, can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your agency and what you do. Thank you very much, Ama. Uh, my name is Akwesi Ajiman, uh, the Chief Executive for the Ghana Tourism Authority. The Ghana Tourism Authority is the principal or key implementing agency under the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture. And our mandate spans four key areas, standards and quality assurance in the industry, marketing and promotion of Ghana as a tourism destination, um, product development and investments into the sector, and finally, uh, research. And so those are the four key areas that we focus on, uh, trying to work with various other agencies to ensure that our tourism sector thrives. Thank you. Thank you, Akwesi. Um, Koshi, um, why don't you go next? Tell us a bit about the Ghana Enterprises Agency. Thank you very much, and it's Koshi. Yes. <laughs> Apologies so, for that. That's okay. Um, I get a lot of different variations. But um, so um, thanks for having us here. My name is Kosti Yanki Aye. I'm the CEO for the Ghana Enterprises Agency, which was formerly the National Board for Small Scale Industries. And our mandate here, quite similar in terms of an, as an implementing agency as well, under the Ministry of Trade and Industry. What we do is to provide support and the growth and development of micro, small, and medium enterprises in this nation to provide and ensure that the enabling environment is conducive or should be made conducive to support the MSMEs in this nation. Thank you, Kosi, not Koshi. Um, so that's the government, um, the government support agencies we have on the panel. We'll turn now to um, uh, Michael, and you're the fund. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Boadueje, CEO of Oasis Capital. Oasis Capital is a private equity and venture capital practice based in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, but with ambition to look at Africa. Um, as of even date, we focus uh, exclusively in five key areas, which are housing and hospitality, health services, financial services. We veered into manufacturing, 
and educational sector. Um, we've done this for 11 years running, but um, our main business is providing money and more uh, by providing patient capital. So we don't just give money and sit, we give money and look out for how best we can help you grow so we can make economic return irrespective of the environment. And you will, you will see in the other subsequent answers that we have demonstrably shown that in spite of the challenges, some of the businesses can still stand the test of time. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And finally, Ajo would love for you to introduce yourself and tell us about your business. <clears throat> Okay, um, thank you everyone and thank you for the opportunity as well. Um, my name is Ajo Dede Asari. I'm the CEO of Alfie Designs Limited. It's a family run business started by my mom, Afinyaku. Um, we are into mass manufacturing of apparel clothing. And um, I, and we train young women and underprivileged girls for free at our training institutes on the factory uh, premises. And our core business is to make clothing accessible. Anything made in Ghana, we want to help promote the agenda of the government about made in Ghana. And so we have been um, exporting to the US, UK, and um, Australia over the past 10 years. And we've done um, things for Whole Foods, we've done for um, Uniform Advantage, we've done for a few of the American companies, as well as some UK private companies as well so and also in Ghana we were called upon one of the first five companies and we all happen to be women when um, the pandemic broke um, late February early March and it was a great privilege for us to be part of the first five factories to do this work and it's been that was the pivot of our company turning around to be able to produce records record numbers in a short amount of time. So yes, that's a little about our PPE designs. Well done, Ajo, for helping us all have access to PPEs when the world was facing a major shortage. So my first question is to Matthew. Matthew, you invest in businesses, you help them grow. And um, I'm sure during the pandemic, it was sort of sleeves rolled up and digging in and helping your businesses survive. So would like to hear from you practically what does a business do when faced with a major crisis like this? What goes into a business continuity plan? What should they do immediately? And how do they, even beyond the, the crisis, how do they build resilience for the long term and to make sure that if anything similar should happen, they don't go down? Um, thank you very much. Um, as uh, economic being the normal thing is to breathe in, pause, and take stock of what it is that you are going through just to understand the situation. Um, one of the key areas is to take a look at your technology to ensure that what is it that you can do to uh, using technology to solve some of the problem. You will take a critical look first off at your human beings and see that they are safe and sound and they are protected and you don't unreasonably expose them you will take a look at your finances to see that you can keep the engine oiled so that by the time you find a solution or understand the circumstance and environment, you still can be alive. And you will then go through the process to see that you have selected the key and essential things and the things that you will have to let go. I think this then become the key pillars of survivor. And then you can then in that process, see the opportunities that you have there. So for instance, we are heavily invested in private education. Um, it was just impossible to run a school because by executive fiat, it was infeasible. It was illegal. They were closed down. However, um, you, in, as human beings, will continue to learn. And some of the institutions also have had a global curriculum. And therefore you cannot sit by and lose a whole year in the life of a younger population. So you needed to explore the opportunity to do that. So as at that time we had about 13 companies, we need to sit down with each one of them 
and go through a plan for each one of them, looking at the human capital, looking at the financials, and we drew up a table thanks to IFC. We have a number of our investors as development finance institutions, so we had all of them give us an input and support that we came with a plan for each of the company and made additional provision for financing uh, the, for instance, in the hospitality industry, which was heavily hit, we had to provide a solution to one of our company who also became one of the providers of uh, space during the airport where we had to put people on, under quarantine. So we provided them with a solution and each company had the capacity and the dry powder that we provided for them. Some of them, we had to structure the transaction differently by giving them extended tenor. Some, we had had to convert our loans from convertible loan into equity to give them flexibility to do that. And that process became a plan that was adopted. And I must say that prior to the pandemic, um, we took a look at uh, continuity, but it wasn't very germane in terms of the way we run our businesses. But from that time, we have learned the hard way and we have that had become part of the process of how we do business because this is only one of the pandemics we've seen. And I'm sure we may see something in the future. It may take a different form, but business will be disrupted as we go along. So we provided for all of them um, in our last quarter, which is a June report. I can say that out of 13 companies, 10 of them are profitable at the bottom and the three that are not profitable are not far from seeing profitability. So we've seen growth in them. We've seen transitioning from more, uh, more inefficient way of doing business to a, a more efficient way of doing business. And it has to do with resource allocation and also the presence of patient capital. Because if we were to enforce all the covenants of the transaction we had with them, then most of them wouldn't be in existence. And we did not sit back for the entrepreneurs to come to us because we are quite aware of the background of the entrepreneurs that they have, the levels of capacity we have in the various organizations, and our job is to provide them with the support to ensure sustainability. Because if those business grow, that is where we make return. And that is in our interest to ensure that the businesses that we put money in can deliver two, three times our money. And to do so, we do not expect that responsibility to vest only in the sponsors and owners of the business. So we are part owners of business. And luckily for us, we have phenomenal capacity by reason of our fund providers who have a history and tradition and they also assisted us very uh, aptly and i think at that time ifc for example came up with eight billion dollars globally to provide a soft landing for institutions so we had to explore that and 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 that is how we navigated it Thank you, Matthew, for breaking it down so well. Before we move to the next um, panelist, when you say resource allocation, you're talking about cutting costs, isn't it? W what does that uh, mean practically for a small business listening? Yeah, you are, you are cutting costs of and, and the things that are unnecessary. So for instance, at a time, uh, you had teachers that are on full time, they cannot teach, but you want to keep them in operation and you want to keep them to survive. So what do you do? You come into a compromise with them and say, during this period, we will still provide you a life-saving compensation and you are immediately restored once the opportunity is given to us to operate. Uh, in some of the, like hospitality, in some cases you've got about 200 employees are you going to keep all of them so that, and even if you kept them, what are you going to pay them? Would you provide a temporary lease and just keep a skeletal staff during the period so that you can reorganize and come back? And most of them have been able to pick back the levels they were before the pandemic. So that is how you take a look at it and see how you can 
provide. So for instance, in some of the schools, you we were able to get a technology that allows us to deliver lectures and teaching online and parents pay about more than 50% of the school fees that they ought to have paid. And all of them, uh, and it's, it's not only the, the institution, but the parents are also working somewhere where resources are challenged. So their pockets are also affected and it had that symbiotic effect and all of us had to make sacrifices. But the good thing is that there was a plan and the plan was followed through. I think it is always better to have a plan uh, rather than not having anything at all. That you'll be caught on our way. Thank you, Matthew, for, for breaking it down so well. Ajo, sure. this was your life over the last um, uh, couple, the last year. Um, Alfi Designs really stepped up and scaled up um, in response to what you shared, the urgent demand for PPEs in Ghana. But I'm sure you had a lot of challenges also. So tell us about your business continuity story. How did the pandemic affect you? What did you have to do to stay alive and, and, and to grow? And what lessons do you have to share with other entrepreneurs who are looking to build resilience, who want to grow their businesses? Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I would say, I don't know how and what happened, but um, um, even the, the opportunity to be chosen because I had been involved the company had been involved in so many trade shows back and forth looking for work we had worked with um kosi um and so many and, um, so many places so um being out there also it kind of helped us as well but when we were told that there was a complete shutdown we had to get all our workers and say you go home give everybody a pay we don't know what's going to happen it's just for two weeks so let's see and then the meetings started and we were called on and so for us it was how to go from a workforce of 120 to 600 in like a blink of an eye we had to grow so for us the it was not unlike what matthew was saying he had to advise his business people was to scale down i had to grow in matter of minutes and hours and so what we had to do was a network get uh, workers to call workers to call workers and it was just flowing get um passes for everybody to be able to move around we linked with um, um, Ayalolo, um, the state transport, to provide buses to go to Vantage Points with the company logo. And those were the things we did. And then there was no food because everybody was told to stay at home. And so we had to now call backup caterers. We need to provide lunch for workers. So in, in that sense, being able to think on the spot, on the go to move things, is another critical thing I'll say entrepreneurs need to do. don't freak out. You need to calm yourself down and think about how can I, and it's also about networking, having people in your network. How do I get to do this? Who do I call to help me to solve this problem? And so it's that togetherness and it's, and you'd be surprised women really pull up for each other during these times. So, oh, don't worry, I know this person, I know this person, let me call, let me call. And then things start to come together. And so that's what happened for us and also, we, at the same time, as Matthew was saying, you had to let some teachers go because of um, life skills that were taught in primary school. Some came to us that, oh, I did life skills to show something, the life skills in secondary school. I can't do some small stitching. We had to do instant training and put people on the machines to get them working. And so that whole setup was really um, the organization of the company getting people to know okay this is what we are doing structure ourselves and so that's what really it is so having a very good team behind you also helps you in times of um, a pandemic i hope none comes again but in times of crisis like this you need a very good solid team that will help push the vision and to get things done and done well and on time and also relying on your networks you have had over the years and then pulling and drawing back from your experiences that you have had on different projects to be able to magnify it to do a better job. So for us, um, those were some of it was for us it was scaling up within very short amount of time and producing targets. And even with that, we had we learned to fulfill things. I mean, I would say that this is the time that I could we did orders on time, had it delivered. Because if you didn't, people were getting sick, people would die. And so that alone really helped. And I think it showed the governments and the people of Ghana that Ghana, we have the opportunity. 
we have the no opportunity we have the people to do the work and even i had calls from nigeria liberia people wanted how did you guys do it how did you guys do it all that is actually making ghana the um gateway to africa i mean in terms of mass manufacturing i think it's a very good opportunity ministry of tourism to really brand it that look ghana we can do this we are at par with our asian counterparts we can do mass production part of and then when you come here by the beach but you can also mass produce your scrubs your things for your hospital or your uniforms for i mean we can do something about this whole thing so for us it was a scale up and it was for us i said this pandemic was a growth process for our campaign and um we are very pleased about the pandemic in that sense great it's it's good to see that there are business opportunities in the middle of any crisis and it's interesting the things you talk about are quite similar to what matthew was talking about um the 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 planning the speed to execution but you also add about networks and um, Kosi, we've heard from the, the financier, we've heard for the entrepreneur. You run the government agency responsible for supporting MSMEs and um, to build resilience to grow. What did you do during the pandemic to support businesses um, like Ajus? And, and how were you helping them build resilience? And what learning can you share with us um, for either businesses or for other um, enterprise support organizations that want to help businesses build resilience? So um, I think the COVID or during the pandemic, we're still in it to a large extent, but it's been one of the most challenging, trying, but also very, um, I think it's, it's been one of our periods in our, the lifeline of this institution where we've had major impact and we've also learned a lot. And I think before, just before the lockdown, there was a lot of conversation with government from the Ministry of Finance and Presidency as to what was going to be done for MSMEs. And I must say governments at that time really took charge and it's very few governments around the world who were able to do that, which was one, how do we get our people resourced to support with PPEs because the whole world was shutting down. And most importantly, how were we going to keep our MSMEs sustained? It wasn't to keep them to grow, like Matthew said, to a large extent, but how do you get them to stabilize? Because, you know, we saw that something happens. The first thing you do is to stabilize. And so how are we going to stabilize these businesses that have been working over the years that have never been filled with any catastrophe or pandemic or epidemic like this? And so what were we going to do about it? So when everybody went home for two weeks, we stayed in the office and worked till midnight almost every day trying to figure out how are we going to do this? How should it look like? And if government is going to get funding to support these businesses, how should we design the framework for it? Because we couldn't allow our businesses to collapse at a time like that. And we couldn't allow businesses to also lay off their employees at a time such as this. So one was the development of what we have, which is the CAP business support, in short, the CAP S, where government committed close to 750 million Ghana cities to provide support to these MSMEs. The challenge and the question was, where do you find them when you've told them to stay at home? And to be able to do that, I think that that's why technology came at a time like this. And so we were forced then as a government institution to move beyond human interaction. But now how do you take it on to technology? How do you provide people access wherever they are in this nation so they can be able to benefit from government support? So we work very closely with local Ghanaian tech entrepreneurs to build a solid platform, a platform that would allow people to apply from everywhere within the nation, any business, be it micro, small, or medium enterprise. And we really emphasize the definition of what these uh, MSMEs should even look like. What we then did was we also used the opportunity and the resilience to be able to also formalize them. Because we realized that in, uh, when you have a pandemic or when you're in a situation like this, having a strong formalized business is important because it then makes interventions easier. It allows us to even see where you are. So what we then were forced to do was to see how we could bring regulatory support to them. How do you regularize your business? How do we do this so that we also ensure that we limit fraud? We are able to also ensure that they're not duplication in the work we do. So then we came on board and said, okay, how do you use your TIN number? Because it's your identity. So how do you intervene with using your TIN number, your phone number, 
um, using a few other parameters, which is very, um, it's only yours to be able to um, do the work that we do. So businesses indirectly were forced to formalize. Then we have this technology platform that allows them to also apply. And for the first time, it gave us a strong focus and a big view of what was happening around the country because we had 900,000 MSMs apply on a system that we never had. And so we were able to also see a pattern of what type of businesses they were, what kind of supports they needed, how the support should come to them. And we looked at it from also, how do we get intervention or funding to them without having the human contact? We're using financial institutions, being able to use uh, mobile money in ways we had never done before to give access to finance to Ghanaian businesses, because that's what they needed at that point to be resilient and really stand strong. Yes, we understand the capacity development and the technical assistance, but at that moment, it was an issue of where do I get funding to sustain what I'm doing? And so government's first intervention and it was perfect for the work that we were doing for these MSMEs across the nation. And then after we stabilized them, we then brought on board the capacity building and the technical assistance so they can continue to grow from that point. So out of that, about close to of funding. Those who didn't, there were many reasons which we actually documented to show them that these are the reasons this is why. But more often than not, the, the goal was to get them and to support with this whole issue of um, resilience, which is what we did. We didn't end there. I think that it was also important. We talked about the fact that most of the times when there's a situation like this, people just sit and say, what do we do? But we actually took it a step further and reached out to our network of partners with the government, the president's support, the minister of finances support, the minister of trade support, went and spoke to our partners who then committed more resources. So resources in the sense of extra funding to do um, business finance support for these MSMEs as well. Those who couldn't benefit from the uh, government COVID cap bus support, but could benefit from other support, we provided it. So we brought on board an extra 90 million Ghana cities. And then we took it a step further as well that you can't just build resilience in businesses by only providing access to finance. So through our partnership with Invest in Jobs with the German um, government, one of the things we did with GIZ and the team was really, how do we digitalize these businesses? Because the way they do business has changed drastically. And for them to be resilient, for them to continue to be sustained in this time, in this era, they needed to go digital. So we piloted a program of putting them all on um, social media, giving them website, giving them the tools, which is technology, software to build businesses. So they could now shift from in-person sales to having a platform where they could sell their businesses and products and make money the same way they did prior to COVID. So there was a lot of work that we did to support these businesses and also went in to provide further interventions. Now, it didn't end there. And I think it was one of the things that the president said um, when we launched the program. He said, this is just the beginning. There's so much more to come. And truly, it has, it has actually been a gift that keeps giving in a positive way. Because we've seen a lot of these businesses grow their businesses at levels we've never even thought and imagined. We saw women businesses being able to access funding. And so for me, COVID was actually a good thing for women brand and own businesses. Because the businesses they do came to the forefront. So if you listen um, to Afi, um, what they told us was about how all the five businesses that showed up were women run. So you realize that that sector, the industry they focus on, became the forefront. They were the fighters, the frontliners. And besides that, due to government interventions and funding to make them resilient, then there was a lot of funds that came in to support women-run businesses. So if you look at our portfolio of about 900,000 businesses, 70% of them were women-owned businesses. The difference between women and the men-owned businesses was that the value of the funds and the supports that women-owned businesses asked for was less than the women men run uh, business. And so the dynamics is quite, it's very interesting. Like if you look at the data, it says a lot. And I think COVID allowed that to happen, to be able to play with data and see how we support women to also build the value of their businesses to get to that point. 
So there was a lot of lessons we learned, learning from COVID, the importance of supporting women-owned businesses and ensuring that they are sustained at a time like this, helping them build their business. And it brought to light the, the issue or the challenges of how women-owned businesses have grown, but how do you help them grow and add value at a time like this? Especially when you have access to financing, that doesn't cripple them because our financing was one-year moratorium, 3%. As the minimum, they had one that had the same one-year moratorium, 7% interest rates. And currently, through the government support, we have two major um, grant support schemes. One is for the tourism enterprises. That is totally grant, but with a strong technical assistance component, using that to build resilience in the sector. And also another for SME grants also, which we are working on now, which is also building the resilience of COVID-affected businesses. So it's actually opened up a pot of funding, right, that never existed for women and men and youth-owned businesses and actually brought funding to the doors that not of people who continuously are the ones who always get funding, but in businesses that are far off. The learnings were also being able to see a vast array of businesses and the need to have data to be able to make informed decisions. And the importance of formalization, because what that formalization then did was allowed for businesses now to make a stronger case, to make it easier for us to be able to build on and provide the needed support that they, they could get to build their businesses to move them forward. So there's a lot, but I can keep going. <laughs> I, I, we, it's always a joy to, to watch you and to see all the excitement um, because of the impact that you've been able to have. And your last comment about the tourism industry and the grants is a great segue to Akwesi who um, is, is running the Ghana Tourist Agency. Tourism has come up in everyone's conversation. We all agree it was one of the hardest hits by the pandemic. And yet it's, it's a great opportunity in Ghana for both impact and financial return. This is the SDG Investment Fair. So tell us more about how your agency is, is supporting the tourism sector to bounce back. So she started talking, um, but we'd love to hear more about the work you're doing. All right, thanks again, Ama. And I believe uh, I'll probably start off with where we started in terms of when COVID struck. I mean, taking a cue from what our president uh, had said, that we need to protect lives. And also recognizing that our industry was more of a touch point for a lot of people, restaurants, um, um, car rentals, uh, food joints, drinking baths. So the first thing we did was to go out there and look at how do we protect lives. And so we provided support in terms of provision of PPEs, uh, in terms of educating uh, the sector, very informal sector, if I should put it that way, on the COVID protocols and how they could live with it. And then also we went ahead with more providing training and capacity building. Because here you are with a sector that is largely informal and having come to a situation of a, a pandemic and not knowing what to do. And so working with other agencies like the, the then MDSSI, now GEA, uh, Cozy mentioned the CAP uh, supports, uh, business supports. And so uh, a lot of our people in the sector benefited from the funding that was provided by GEA. Um, we also went a step further to engage other agencies. Um, we realized that if you look at the restrictions that were put in place, our sector is a sector of public gathering. And so to that extent, anytime there's a pandemic and anytime there's restrictions on public gathering, then we are the ones who suffer. And so working with them, we now had to come up with new guidelines and protocols to ensure that the restrictions on some of the sectors could be eased. And so work with the various restaurants on the COVID protocols and then made a case for the easing of restrictions on these subsectors. Then training. Uh, we reckon that a lot of the sector operators were living in uh, normal times, but now we had a new normal, digitization. And so how were we able to provide them with tools of their trade? And so if you look at groups like the Kente Weavers, uh, the art center people who were used to people trooping into their uh, shops to buy goods. And now the airports were shut. 
nobody was coming. And so now we had to move them into uh, the digital space. And that also enabled a lot of them to start bouncing back. And the support that they got from uh, GA also became very, very crucial to their survival because for a very long time, even the provision of uh, these PPEs, we had anticipated that um, COVID probably within a six months horizon will be a thing of the past. And so we were not able to provide uh, up to a year and they had to now look for their own funds to continue with the support. And so access to cheap money became critical access to ways that they could also uh, rely on their own um, counterparts to assess some of these PPEs became also uh, critical. And then moving on from there, uh, working with other agencies, uh, I think GA has become uh, a key partner in this. Um, Kosi mentioned that tourism enterprise support that is currently being uh, run also became uh, crucial in that sense. Then we said, okay, how do we then now start pushing business? Because as the restrictions were being eased, as things were opening up, we then took the lead in marketing, uh, which is one of our key uh, things we do. And now the international arrivals had dwindled. We had moved from over a million in 2019 to around 355 in 2020. So domestic tourism and regional tourism became the new focus. And so we launched a new campaign, uh, Experience Ghana, Share Ghana, uh, working with the tour operators union of Ghana to drive domestic tourism. And so we started seeing a lot more people who hitherto were probably going to travel to uh, Dubai, South Africa, and other places now, looking to Ghana as a, uh, a place to be. And so we exposed the market, we exposed the players, we exposed the establishments that we had, and then also renewed our commitment to work with them to improve customer service. So customer service training became one of the things that we started off and we are currently also working on under the Ghana Cares project. So, so those are some of the things that we did. And I must say our industry has shown resilience. Unfortunately, not every uh, subsector has been opened up. We still have uh, the nightclubs. And I mean, given the setting that we, we have. Uh, we've been working with them. Recently, we worked with the cinema operators to ensure that the movie houses were open. So we've been in the thick of affairs. We've been in the front line working with uh, the operators and also other agencies. So those are some of the learnings that we've picked. That the other agencies that we could rely on, GA being one of them, GIPC, in terms of also trying to focus uh, investment into the tourism sector. And so a few months ago, we did a diaspora investment summit to look at how we can bring in um, African diaspora funds into the sector. Digitization also became another thing that we did. And so during the period, we launched uh, what we call the Visit Ghana app, uh, trying to bring everybody into one uh, single window or one marketplace so that those who were not accessible uh, digitally could now also have uh, at no cost to them, a means to sell their uh, goods and services. And capacity building, we also reckon, was very, very important. So those are some of the learnings that uh, we've had. And I can say that we've seen a gradual uh, improvement in terms of visitation to tourist sites, in terms of hotel occupancy, uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, the food chain and everything that uh, people now were packaging better than before because they reckon that now this is how we do the new normal and we need to live with it. Thank you. Thank you, Akwesi. The same themes um, that Koshi shared run through partnership and digitization. And it looks like this pandemic brought with it quite a few um, positives and that's great to see. Matthew, um, coming back to you, you talked when you first presented about the way you, you, you helped your clients, you restructured the financial um, contracts that they had with you. And I know that many, many businesses struggle to access patient capital like yours. And this is a major constraint to the growth of businesses in Ghana. So tell us, how does a company fundraise in a time of crisis like that? 
when financial institutions like yours are becoming more conservative. Um, the country is recovering, um, people are looking for business and for money now that they've stabilized to grow. Um, what do they need to do to be able to access such funding and um, to be able to deliver the returns that you're looking for, convince you that they can deliver the returns you're looking for and, and partner with funds like yours? I think, uh, thank you very much. I think you need to move with the storm uh, because at that point, you have to understand the sector that you are in. Hitherto, we, before the pandemic, our fund did not, for instance, pay much attention to digital businesses or FinTech and other things. But as part of our own business uh, continuity program, and we had to, come up with a new strategy because we reckon quickly that the world had changed forever and that was going to be with us. So we included on the list technology enabled businesses. So it's for the business to understand the new order. Uh, for instance, um, we kept on hold investment into the hospitality industry, uh, especially in hotels. Um, because you no, know, as Kwesi indicated, you, tourism arrival, which is drive, driven by, I mean, tourism in Ghana, driven by the foreign uh, travels, had slowed down, um, dropped from a, over a million to under 300,000 or about 300,000. That meant that revenues are going to uh, be still at that time. So we need to look at it. But as we study the trend, you would see that domestic tourism is also beginning to pick up. So that means that the focus of investment may not be in your typical five-star, four-star hotel in Accra, but you are going to look at a resort in Zabzugu Tatale or in Ebri or in uh, Kumasi or any other place that you are more likely. And this is quite clear with the middle class, we are upwardly mobile people. Um, you ordinarily go to Santorini or you go to Dubai or any other place. And if it's not safe or you are not clear whether you want to go, you will still want to get out there with a limited opportunity. So the first thing you do is to look into the environment and see what opportunities you have. I mean, we then paid attention more to investing in health services so we had to write checks in health services, uh, all of which had incremental revenue. You can imagine that if you were an investor in those that provided the COVID testing, you would also be laughing the same way as Joy is happy, um, except that I'm not sure she will pray that the pandemic should continue or another disaster should come. Uh, we are all praying we get out of this quickly, but in that comes with opportunities. There are some platforms we uh, invested in, in terms of even educational sector that even after school reopened, they are still being used. So you become innovative and those innovations would come to stay with you. So in the field of uh, difficulties, it is for the business people to begin to think steady the environment and see which direction you want to go. But one thing we can assure is that we are traditionally patient capital providers and we became even more patient uh, during that time. And we have come to the realization that businesses, as it happens to all the people, uh, businesses in the short term, everybody is ambitious, but in the long term, business projections tend to be right. If you put entrepreneurs here, and I think I put this question before a couple of entrepreneurs that do, how many businesses do you, start a business do you think fail in their first five years? Or they, and they say, oh, over 90%. Um, so, and there were about 10 people. It means that you all agree that nine, nine of you, your business will fail. But when I flip the question and say that, how many of you believe that after five years, your business would exist? then all of them believe that their business will exist. 
right? But from just a moment before, they believe that startup business fail. So all we need is having a long-term plan, being patient, and converting our business into a model that we follow through systematically and try to look at the opportunities to minimize the cost of operation and become more efficient. I think if you presented a case in that way, we would be able to sign you a check. I think that we haven't written off completely any sector that we are investing in. Uh, we kept it on hold, for instance, in hotels. But today we are looking at a couple of hotels that may get a check, except that the focus that we would have done earlier has now changed to a different type of hotel because of the what lessons that we've learned. Because from hindsight, everybody is wiser. So that is a key point that we are still available. We are still interested in providing patient capital to support business. Um, you need to present us a good case and we will look at you. Thank you, Matthew. So yeah. over to you Thank businesses in the audience. Um, you can present a big, a good case. Once you have a good case, you're creating value. Financiers will look at you. Ajo, as have they convinced you? You're the entrepreneur. We've had people talking about the support that they provided to businesses and how to access funding. But the question is, what support do businesses actually need to build resilience? Um, what more could um, agencies like the Ghana Enterprises Agency, the Ghana Tourism Agency, other enterprise support um, organizations do to support businesses to thrive and to deliver on jobs? As a nation, we are committed to make sure this sector grows. And from your experience building your business, what do we need to do to, to make this happen? Okay. Um I think Marty knows me. We've had a few discussions before. Um, financing is good. Capacity building is amazing. But actual, actual purchase orders, actual work is what will make the business move. If our government, um, headed by our president, had not decided that, look, everywhere else in the world, um, they are short on PPEs. Instead of us all relying on China, let's look inwards. What can we do? Let's give all these millions of uh, nose marks and thousands of PPEs. Let us sew it ourselves. Let us get the fabric. Let's use GTP fabric. Let's use ATL fabric, drop on textiles. Let us come together, our own cotton. Let's use it here. Trust me, my growth will not have happened if that opportunity was not given. And so I would say that yes, providing financing is good. That makes us that makes most of the businesses out there just merchants because everything is just transactional. But if we want to change our economy to manufacturing like ours, that then will provide large scale jobs. We need to really look inwards. Tourism, all the hotels, nobody should um, order or buy anything from outside. Let's make the cleaners' uniforms, everything should be made. Um, their uniforms, everything should be made with either GTP fabric. Let us use made in Ghana things. If those things are done, trust me, every factory will be sewing non stop because then we are providing bare sheets. Yes, we want to have that 100% silk cotton counts from Egypt. Cool, we are not there yet, but we can use GTP. It's nice. We can let them use mesmerized cotton. Bit by bit, we are building it up, we are building it, and then they get more funding to diversify the cotton, make some poly, make some silk, and then we are growing. That's what the other countries are doing. And I feel manufacturing, my sector, is the gateway of employing a lot of people because then the numbers I was able to employ over the, the months into a year was amazing. And the when I also did my data, let's just, let's just say I had 600 people working and a, a household is four people average, just multiply the number of people that were affected that probably lost their jobs. But because one member was working somewhere, got the continuation of the job. So that's one thing I would say. Financing is great. If I come to Matthew and I don't have an existing order to sew uniforms for security or um, police or anything, how do I pay Matthew back? I can't. I, I will try, but your one dress your one shirt, your one kaftan can't pay back Matthew, was, but it's the large volume. So, so let's look inwards and build this capacity because the efficiency level we're able to uh, 
she achieved was amazing because we're continuously working from March all the way to this year, March. And so we were working continuously. And now I could feel like I, when I went to India and I went onto the factory floor, we were working seven days a week. We had two shifts at a point. We even had three shifts. Amazing. And that's the kind of bustling um, thing we want to have here. So I would say as an entrepreneur, let's make available the things that will grow our businesses. Let's place all the orders in-house. Yes, we'll make a few mistakes here and there. Sometimes we delay but then in the end, you are building the capacity, you are building it. So by the time the country fully opens up for exports, it was the same thing China did. They did everything in-house, made all their mistakes. By the time the world realized, everybody's producing from China. Everybody was producing. So we can do the same thing here. And doing the PPEs was the exact thing that really, I hope everybody saw that we can do it. We have the capacity to do it here. And so... Um, I would say as a business, as an entrepreneur, financing is good, capacity is good, because I've done a lot of capacity training, I've had expatriates come in, but when we were doing hands-on, then the lessons, so, oh, okay, they said line formation, oh, okay, this now makes sense, and so then you put your training, but before then, it was not practical, because there was no need for it, so I would say as an entrepreneur in the manufacturing space, we need to have policies that would direct everything in-house into the country. Let's produce everything in here, get our surrounding countries and neighbors to also produce. Liberia producing from us, oh, we can do scraps, sell to them. We can do um, hospitality uniforms, sell to them. Oh, your cleaners, this, that, that. We, we can do all digital embroidery, all that on the large scale, T-shirts, all these things can be done. And even for the... Um, hotels these you know when you go to new york it says i love new york with those bags we can do some with the kente and then write i love ghana and then be selling it all the so when people come they have a piece of ghana to take away with them or even in the hotel to put their little bags as they are at the beach these are things that can actually help more people so the kente weavers association are always doing something we are always sewing we are always moving around so these are like the practical things I would say would help push. And my, my sector, my industry, our sector actually employs a lot more people. Mm. But anywhere you pass, you see somebody sewing in a container, in a shop, something. And yeah. we actually employ the masses. So I think that if we are, attention was brought towards my side <laughs> in the sector, I think it would be very, very helpful. I'm just advocating for the apparel side. So just saying. Right. So Kosi and Kosi and Akwesi, um, purchase orders. That is what um, the, the, the ask is for entrepreneurs and government should become a customer also. And I believe you are, but we could do more to purchase more from local MSMEs. And so I'm going to shift back to you as we wrap up this panel, maybe starting with Kosi. Your agency has been strengthened. You've been given an expanded mandate. You just launched, congratulations. Um, entrepreneurs want to see large purchase orders coming in addition to training and financing, and they promise they'll deliver on jobs. I think it's 400,000 jobs that we need to deliver in the next three years for Ghana Kiss. So what resources do you have available through your agency to help businesses? And what should businesses expect from you over the next year? And will you be, be helping us get some major purchase orders um, for various key industries? So I, I think the question of purchase orders, I think that it's not government's job. I, let me be honest, to provide purchase orders. So, I, so I, I think it was more of ordering. I mean, ordering locally instead of oh, and importing. So for Ghanaian businesses or people like yourself to wear more Ghanaian made outfits? No, for, for the government, for example, buying um, uniforms for military and buying uniforms for, for other security services from Ghanaian producers instead of importing from other countries. So government so is, is a purchaser. Yeah. So that is something that I think that as associations, that's why we have these associations. So you come together as associations to lobby governments to do that. And we will, from our part, will also try our best. But I think the onus really lies on the associations and the members to really put a strong um, bit in, in terms of um, productivity, in terms of 
if they can meet also the orders and the support will come. And I think an example has been done with the mask. So I think that as associations, they need to really strengthen and build more, of the yes, the capacity and also lobby um, other agencies. For us as Ghana Enterprises Agency, our work really is cut out for us. Really, yes, to support and grow and strengthen MSMEs. We'll continue to prepare them so that they also build quality products. We have a program called the Kaizen Program, which works on continuous improvement because there's a need to improve the quality of some of the things that we do if you're going to compete not only locally but internationally as well. Because if you are aware, the, also the AFTAC, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, has kicked off. And so the competition is not only local, it's also external. And with borders open, there's the need for us to have quality products. And so under our Kaizen program, I think we've done some with a couple of them. I'm not sure if we've done it with AFI, but a lot of the AGAMS members who fall under the association, she's a member, have benefited from Kaizen, where we've gone into their industries, improved productivity, reduced waste, and actually help them with access to markets at levels they haven't seen before. So we'll continue to do that to support them. Another thing is also the access to finance. So we intend, and one of the mandates that we were given as the new Ghana Enterprises Agency was a set up of an MSME fund. And through that, we started the engagement with various partners, the World Bank, really looking at sampling the market to see what is there, what is existing in middle, missing, um, which is the missing middle, which I said before the missing. But um, yes, really looking at the missing middle and how we can provide the support so that people like Matthew can then take them up and really strengthen them. You know, there is funding. I always say there's a lot of money, but it's, it's what type of money and also where are the people, which is a lot of things, challenges that a lot of private firms or others face. So how do we then come in and polish so that people, businesses, venture fans, uh, private equity funds can then come in and take it up and take it to the next level um, for them to grow and become bigger and better. One of the things we've also done is really a major partnership with the Food and Drugs Authority because we realized that a lot of the products that were being made were lacking in having their regulatory support or regulatory certification. And so through our support and designing, um, FDA designing the progressive licenses, we've been able to resource over a thousand products within a short period of time, not even in one year, and it's all fully funded by us. And we'll continue to do that. We need to expand that and get it out. We also look at digitalization really from support for SMEs. So for those who are looking for markets and purchase orders, how do we place them in positions where they use digital tools, they are selling on the market, they e-commerce, they're doing their digital, being able to buy and sell on, 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 on digital tools to be able to build that. And we're looking to expand that program also to ensure that we build on it. We also have this major platform, which is the Ghana Women's Entrepreneurship Network. And there's a lot of resource going into it because we've realized that over the years, we've done a lot of work. In the past four years, my intervention touched the lives of about 700,000 um, people, 60% of whom were women across the length and breadth of the nation. As I told you, I have 190 offices, 37 business resource centers across the entire nation. And so our reach and our touch is really widespread. Now, we realized that how do we provide additional support to these women entrepreneurs? And due to that, looking at what we're doing in the SDGs, we are really harnessing and helping on our um, women's entrepreneurship network to build it, to provide it with more support so that among themselves, they build relationships to actually buy from each other. So that is the first step of the market, is how do you network? And the importance of that network cannot be underestimated. That network would allow people to know each other, to say that, okay, I'm a fashion designer, but I need a production line to produce my, 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 my products. Can you support me? Or I'm a hotelier. I have a hotel. I'm a woman-run hotel, and I need support. How do I get that? How do you also sew um, the, the dresses of the people we have within our, our institution? So this network is very, very important. It will also take in place in mind the policies that need to be driven it will take into consideration the challenges that these businesses are facing, how to translate that into policy, which would initially then be translated also into um, implemented into really actual work. And most importantly, our goal within the Ghana Enterprises Agency is to implement the first micro, small and medium enterprise and entrepreneurship policy 
the first time that Ghana has even set up a policy. And it's really important and particular to us because it lays out clearly what the challenges we face and see that impact negatively or positively on these MSMEs and how to use this policy to drive an implementation plan that will really transform the MSMEs within this nation. So there's a lot coming and a lot happening currently in the years to come in terms of access to finance, in terms of BDS. It's also important for us to know that, I mean, government has a major plan looking at youth employment and job creation, which is at the bottom line of everything that we do. And looking at all of this in the coming weeks and months is really the rollout of a massive plan to really ensure that entrepreneurship, MSMEs that have existing businesses have the needed support to be able to drive the government's agenda within this current time. Thank you, Kosi. Lots of exciting things coming up. We're just about to wrap up this part of the conversation. So to our audience, if you have any questions, you can begin to put them in the chat and we're going to open up and allow for you to ask questions, whether it's to the funders or to the entrepreneurs or to the government agencies. Um, so Ajiman, I will end with you. Um, maybe let's end with an example. We had quite a few examples from manufacturing about resilience. And tell us about tourism and maybe some success stories that you have, either from the businesses or from the support that you were given on how these businesses were able to continue business operations, build resilience um, during this pandemic time and to inspire our audience who may be facing similar challenges. All right, thank you very much, Amma. And I think um, from where I ended the last time, I highlighted the fact that a lot of our operators are informal. And so to that extent, when you have a pandemic that does not allow people to move around, to go to the shops, to go to wherever they have to go and do things in a new way, then they are disadvantaged. And so instead of pointing to just one or two, I'll look at areas that have seen some significant progress. And so if you take, for example, the arts and crafts sector, the art centers, and these were people who were always used to more like wait, visitors come, sample products, and then they buy. Now, with the new normal that we are in, we've seen a significant shift to digital platforms. And so if you go to, let's say the Kente Rivers Association, if you go to Bonri, you go to Atasumansu, you go to uh, even in Tonso, you see that the numbers are not there, but they will tell you that they are doing business better than they were doing pre-COVID. How did that happen? Because a lot of them now have adopted digital marketing as the new normal for them. And so utilizing some of the existing platforms, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, they're able to showcase their products. Hitherto, they thought people would come because there were always buses of uh, tourists coming in and buying this stuff. They are not coming. So they now to now to have to push their products into the market. So I would say the art center uh, segment of our, of our industry, uh, the fashion, I mean, you see more people uh, doing wonderful stuff. I mean, like uh, Afi said, government intervention in, in terms of uh, purchasing PPEs locally did help. But then you've seen with uh, some of the uh, campaigns we've run, see Ghana, eat Ghana, wear Ghana. And so you've seen a gradual shift in people feeling proud to wear Ghana. And where are they getting these uh, uh, clothes from the local market? So fashion has also seen an improvement. And then uh, we've had one or two, I mean, I will cite an example of, let's say, Asmera restaurants. Uh, this was a restaurant where uh, nicely set up, had people come in uh, for their lunch and all those things. And now people could not come because even when things opened up, people were just afraid to go out there and sit. But then they also then moved their uh, services into takeouts. And so between Asmera, uh, Buka, and the rest, you've seen that they are still, they've survived and they are even doing better business through a different strategy. 
uh, we have the Sai Wine and uh, Champagne um, uh, Club, which now has moved to just seven uh, wines and to now a full uh, uh, value uh, proposition. And so these are some of the examples that we have. But um, for us, even as an authority, we've also benefited from COVID in a way because we've also now moved a lot of our things digitally. And so the industry itself has become a bit more digital with the launch of our Visit Ghana app, um, our Inspect Trade Division, which used to be very manual, now has gone digital. And so we've done a few things, um, although we had plans to move there, but we've had to fast track a lot of our digitization because of COVID. And so across the length and breadth of our industry and across the value chain, we've seen some progress in that direction. Thank you, Akwesi. That's a, a really inspiring way to finish this part of the program. Um, lots of themes that run through digitization. Um, it's a major one. Um, it's an enabler. It's something that's here to stay. Um, Matthew talked about planning and the need to really look at how you allocate resources. And that if you want money, you need to create real value. You need to have uh, a business that actually delivers. Um, I just um, talked about the, 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 the upscaling and the, the resilience and networks that you, you needed to plug in to really scale up. Um, and also um, made a, a passionate appeal, which I'm going to echo again for government and, and for Ghanaians in general to purchase from our, our local industry so they can grow. We're going to open up now to Q&A and allow our audience to be able to ask questions. And we'll look in, and you can put it in the chat and I'll read out. And um, thank you uh, to our panel for this engaging conversation. 